Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to look at how to get a 20 out of 20 on the Chem IA2 and this is going to be a breakdown of like the ISMG and all of that sort of stuff. So something my chemistry teacher used to always say to us, he would always go, girls, most of your assignments are actually garbage, but they fit the ISMG, so you're going to get a 20 out of 20. And I think that's really, really important to remember that you do not need to have a perfect assignment. You don't need to have a perfect anything. It doesn't have to be amazingly scientific, not like published in a journal, nothing like that to get a 20 out of 20. And to be quite frank, a lot of assignments that get 20s out of 20s aren't even that good. But let's start off. I've got the ISMG here on the right hand side. Don't worry about the highlighting in it. Um, this this is what just what I got off the QCAA website and it was off a sample response. So don't worry about that highlighting there. And I am going to take you through my um, year 12 IA2. I got a 20 out of 20 on this one and yeah, it was perfect. So, well, in the sense of the ISMG. So first thing, thing we want to start off with is our title. And your title just wants to be a really quick summary of your... Um, whole experiment. So mine was the effect of changing electrolyte con concentration on cell potential of a galvanic cell. And before I keep going, I want to talk to us about the easiest two marks you are going to get. And they are going to be your communication marks. And I don't want anybody to go home without these two marks. So basically what you need is to be fluent and concise with your scientific language and representations, have an appropriate use of genre conventions and acknowledge your sources. So acknowledgement of sources is really easy. What you need to do is you need to do your in-text referencing like this throughout every time you bring in an idea from the outside. And then at the end, you also need to have your reference list in alphabetical order down the bottom and you can see mine mine is pretty large it is the entire page and if you want to be doing well you need to be having lots of different references so that is all about the referencing now QCAA doesn't tell you whether it needs to be Harvard or APA or anything like that the referencing style is actually up to your school so your school will have a policy just ask your teacher if you don't know how what style of reference in my school did APA 7 it really doesn't matter as long it's a, if as long as you're following the referencing conventions of a real thing. Um, appropriate use of genre conventions. So basically, this means have a title. Make sure you order it with these headings that I show you on the way through. And then whenever you have anything like a figure, make sure that you title the figure with a reference. And if you ever have a table, make sure you include your units. So your voltage or your um, molar, anything like that. And if you have a graph like this one, make sure the graph has a title. It has... Um, a uh, where is it here oh, I actually messed that one up there okay let's look at this one so this one we have a title we have a legend we have got our x and our y axes um, and if we have units on the axes we have that we include any trend lines or r squared values necessary and we also give that like our proper reference so just making sure that everything has the correct labels everything like that the last thing is a fluent and concise use of scientific language and reference presentations. So basically that means use third person, don't talk about I, we, anything like that, and basically just make it sound like mature and not, yeah, so we did an experiment and it was cool. Nothing like that. But these are our easiest two marks and you guys all should be getting those very, very easy. But other than that, let's go through it and let's start off with this top part, which is sort of like the rationale um, slash intro. I'm, I did forget what this is called. It's been a while since I've done it, but yeah. The first one here is we need a considered rationale for the experiment. And this is what I have here. And it is pretty large and there are lots of different things we need to include. First of all, really basic information about everything you're doing. So I say what a redox reaction is. I say what a galvanic cell is and how the galvanic cell works. And then I start talking about cell potential because this is what we talk about in the question. And this is also where you want to include any equations or any maths. So I have it included the Nernst equation in here. And it is also really important that you actually um, define the variable. So I just put where and then all the variables 
variables in the table. Then I explain what the Nernst equation is and then I talk a little bit about how we can change um, the cell things, all of that sort of stuff. Now one more thing that um, some teachers like, some pe teachers don't like is like one sentence on the real world use of this and I just said that galvanic cells are used for battery and fuel cells and if we investigate this we can improve these applications. It's really not a big part of it. At the end, um, at some point in your rationale, you do want to talk about your original experiment. And I also include a diagram of the setup of the original experiment. If you, um, at any point, um, if you are using a setup or an experiment, which you will be in chemistry, I really highly recommend putting a diagram in the um rationale some teachers it really depends likes you to list the independent dependent and controlled variables and you can just put them in dot points to save words and then at the very end of that rationale you should be putting in your research question now here it says a specific and a relevant research question so basically you just want to make it as specific as possible so i said how does changing these two electrolytes which was copper and zinc that's what i was using how does that affect the cell potential of the specific zinc copper galvanic cell i didn't just say galvanic cell i specified zinc copper and then i also specified what variables i was keeping constant so in your research question you should mention independent variables your dependent variables and your controlled variables. So your research question should have something, all of those three in there. And the really basic but foolproof way of doing it is how does changing blah affect blah while keeping blah constant? Because that gives you, um, you we've got our constant down here and then um, here we've got our dependent variable and then up here we have our independent variable. So that there is like the foolproof way of getting your research question right. So that is um, that one. And there are um, like six marks available in this section. So we do want to do it well. The next one is justified modifications to the methodology. So we would have a look and these are my modifications here. So we have three options for modifications, refinement, redirection and extension. You actually don't need to have all three. You can have two like just a refinement and a redirection like I have here and still be okay because it does say modifications you do need more than one um, a pretty foolproof way of doing this is to have a table like this this also saves a lot of words with the nature in one column so refinement re re redirection or extension then put what the actual modification is and then your justification and it's really important to have this justification column here because to get that top mark it does say it needs to be justified and if you don't put this column it is really easy to accidentally forget to justify it so your refinements need to improve the experiment, not change it, but improve it. So to improve my experiment, I added more trials to increase precision and improve reliability. And I also used a digital voltmeter rather than an analog one, which just improves how we are going to measure our voltage. So our refinements are our improvements. Redirection is probably the more obvious one. And basically redirection is what did you change from the original experiment. So I changed um, the combinations of concentrations. So the first experiment, I just did like one molar and one molar, but here I was doing like one molar and 0 0.25 molar. I use multiple concentrations of each electrolyte. So as I said, I only use one molar of each last time, but I think I have four or five different concentrations of each electrolyte this time. And then last thing was I only used one combination of electrodes. Um, in the original experiment, I used like four or five different electrodes, but this time I reeled it back into having two. So redirection, what did you change? In refinement, what did you improve? I don't believe extensions are very good modifications to make because at the end of the assignment, you actually need to talk about further extensions to your experiment. So I really think leaving your extensions um, for the end is the best thing to do. 
Um, so we've got our justified modifications. Now we need to look at a methodology that enables the collection of sufficient relevant data. Basically that just means have a good experiment that means you can actually get data out of it. And that basically is always just do the experiment that your teacher tells you to do. I know in physics a group in my class decided to do their own random experiment and they had to do the whole thing all over again because they literally could not collect data from it. So that dot point is very easy. You basically just need um, an experiment that gives you data. Then the last one in this section is your considered managements of risks and ethical or environmental issues. So the big thing here is we've got risks. We have to do our risk, but it says and ethical or environmental issues, not or ethical or environmental issues. It's and, which means you have, must have at least one ethical or environmental issue in there. So let's have a look at mine. So my risk was shattered glassware uh, and I had harmful chemicals. And then my last one, because these two are risks, they could hurt you. But this last one was my environmental concern. I said, if you incorrectly dispose your chemical waste, you can cause environmental damage. So that covers both the risk side of it and the ethics and environmental side of it. To get the foolproof risk assessment down, you really do need to have a table just like this with risk in one column and then how you manage the risk in the other column. And that is this first section all done and you just got six marks. Let's move on. So this first dot point up here, the main point is um, correct and relevant processing of data and you use that using visual and graphical representations and algorithms. But notice that it says visual and graphical rec um, representations. That means tables aren't always the best. We always want to get a graph in there. I am begging you to put a graph in. So first of all, what you need to do is you need to put the raw data just in a table point blank. And that is what I've done. And that's all you need for the raw data. Then you need to move on and show what data that you've processed. You, you should write a small little segment about what you actually did and then show it. You do need to have a sample calculation table for everything you did. So I did majority of my processing in Excel but you need to show those calculations, at least one in here. So the ones I included was how I diluted the chemicals, how I found the mean, how I found the reaction quotient, how I found um, the cell potential, how I found the theoretical voltage using the Nernst equation, my absolute uncertainty, my percentage uncertainty, my absolute error, and my percentage error. Those were every single calculations I did. Now, some of these, like the mean of the three trials, seems so stupid because everyone knows how to do mean. It doesn't matter. You still need to put it in there. And your sample calculations don't go towards your word count. So it doesn't matter. This down here just reminded me um, to let you guys know that I originally did this on Google Docs. And then when I uploaded it into OneNote to do this video, it changed the formatting of it. So this having your table run over two pages, you actually can't do that. You need to make a second table because that is bad scientific communication. So something like that would not fly in the real thing. And make sure that we are um, doing our um, labels. Now, something that is really important to note when it comes to figure headings, if it is a table, the heading goes above the data. And if it is a figure, so a graph, the heading goes below the data. That is something very important to remember. So our correct and relevant processing, a lot of that comes through the sample calculations, but it also comes in the way you lay out your graphs, I mean your tables, and also if you do correct graphs. So what I did was I did the regular graph, right, which ended up looking like a logarithmic relationship, and then to make it easier to understand, I linearized it. So if you don't get a linear relationship, make sure that you linearize it. That shows excellent like processing of data. So that's all the stuff you need to do to your data. Let's go on to the analysis. So sorry, this bottom dot point here um, is all about the collection of sufficient and relevant raw data. And that is where um, you need to show your actual raw data to prove that you like collected it well. 
Then this middle dot point is where like the whole chunk of it comes through. First of all, you need to thoroughly identify relevant trends, patterns or relationships and then the uncertainty and limitations of evidence. So you need all of those things and thorough means there is nothing that you have left out. So let's have a look at what I have done. Now, um, and oh, on top of that, Thorough identification also improves qualitative um, observations. So even if you didn't see anything, you still have to say there were no qualitative observations because that is what gets you the thorough mark. What you really need to be doing is finding every relationship here, talking about the trend line, talking about the R squared value. And you also need to... Um, use any references in here, anything like that. You also need to talk about any uncertainty or limitations. So I talk about how all experimental values were lower than the theoretical ones, which could be attributed to systematic error. And then I said what that systematic error could possibly be, which was incorrectly calibrated equipment. Then you should talk about the theory behind it. So talk about the theory behind what you found. Why did you find that? And then if that is what it's meant to be, did your data match that? So in here, I talk about the theory of what Q should be and what our relationship should look like. And then I say, this is confirmed by the data. And then I use specific numerical values to show that. So that is all of our analysis in there. And it is quite a bit, but basically you need to talk about anything that you could possibly think of. And you also need to talk about any mistakes that you may have made. Then we need to move on to the conclusion. And just um, a bit of a note on these. These can be demonstrated under different headings. As long as they're in the report, that's all that matters. Now, insightful interpretation, um, it's basically just justify conclusions linked to the research question. So the easiest way to really obviously link it to the research question is to open your conclusion with, to answer the research question and then write your answer. So mine was, electrolyte concentration affects cell potential with a logarithmic relationship. Then I went into that a little bit deeper. So that is the easiest way to show that you have linked it to the research question. To make it justified, that's when you need to bring that data back down. So bring those voltages back down, explain what you saw, say the trends again. It is basically just a summary of what you already said in the analysis section. To also justify it, you also need to bring the theory back in. So my theory was actually using Le Chatelier's principle because this is also at equilibrium when it comes to redox and all of that. So my theory that justified it and confirmed my relationship, um, what I found, my data, was Le Chatelier's principle. And I also um, talked about, use that for validity and a bit more later on. And I will talk about that in just a moment. So that is our justified conclusions. And then the last two are our reliability and validity and our improvements and extensions. And the reliability and validity must be justified and the improvements and extensions must be logically derived from the analysis of evidence. Not the conclusion, but the analysis of the evidence. So let's have a look at that. So I talked about... Um, validity here my validity to justify myself saying that it was a valid experiment was that i said that the, it, the values did follow the trend modeled and predicted by the nernst equation and le chatelier's principle which meant it was a valid experiment i then went on to talk about error which i did calculate using percentage error and all of that and i give um some reasons for why that could be maybe i created the um like certain um, dilutions incorrectly, maybe the true concentrations on the solutions were not as um, labelled. I did use two different voltmeters and when swapped between the same concentration, they were significantly different. So I was able to make the inference that one of them was calibrated incorrectly and it's unsure which one. So I then did talk about the uncertainty of that and I do believe it does say uncertainty in here. 
No, it actually doesn't say uncertainty, but I do think it is important to talk about our um, reliability with our uncertainty. So you find the voltmeter and the pipette is really all I used. I talked about percentage error, which indicated high accuracy and also uncertainty to indicate precision. Now, precision actually does not have to be in your experiment. Nowhere does it say it, so I don't know why I did it. Um, you should also have error bars in your figures to talk about um, just you know a visual representation and something to bring up. And because I had low error and low uncertainty, I was able to say that my method was reliable and highly valid. Now, something a lot of people think is that their experiment must be reliable and valid. But if you find that you've got bad accuracy and bad precision, that's completely okay. As long as you analyze it well, you still get that 20 out of 20 because you are not getting marked on your lab skills. You are getting marked on your analysis and evaluation of data. So you showing that you understand that your data was bad is showing those evaluation skills. So that is something really important to consider. And the last thing we want to look at is our limitations, our improvements and our extensions. So some people put limitations with the data. I personally put them um, down in this table because I then um, had the limitation. I talked about how it affected the experiment and then I gave it an improvement or an extension. So the improvements must make the experiment better, not change it. So mine was... You know, I had the assumption that the room temperature, one of my um, um, solutions saturated, we used different voltmeters, and some were not created manually, some solutions. So all of those are limitations because they affect our reliability and our validity. And when we can improve those by using better equipment or something like that. And it's really important to say how it affects your reliability and validity because that is like an automatic mark right there. Then the very last part is our extension. And our extension is basically, what did we not look at? So for my experiment, I only looked at concentrations between 0.5 molar and 2 molar. So what about the extreme lows and the extreme highs? I didn't test that out. So that could be an extension. The other two was that the pressure and the temperature in the room remained constant. And temperature and stuff and pressure could affect cell potential. So that is a different direction I could take this into. And that's how I would extend this experiment and go further with it. From there, you just have your reference list and then um, your appendices. My first appendix was the original method from the textbook. You don't actually need this. I just put it in there anyway. And this doesn't go towards the word count. And, and I also had a second appendix that I have removed for privacy. But basically, it was my generated risk assessment that my group and I used. So that is how we need to do our IA2s. You get a 2000 word limit. I suggest use it all. You don't have to use it all, but I strongly suggest it. Any calculations, any data, um, any reference list, any references, none of that count in the word count, but the rest of it all does. I really hope I went through that quite clearly. If you have any questions about the Chem IA2, please let me know. And thank you so much for watching.